Hi, I'm Kenny Yates, and this is End Times. We've had several questions asking, who are the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, and can we identify them? So let us read Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 through 14. We're not going to be going through it verse by verse, but I would like to read the whole portion of Scripture, breaking it up in sections as we read. So let us start with Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So 1,260 days is around three and a half years, which is around the same amount of time that the beast out of the sea from Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 through 8, reigns and rules the whole earth for. The temple itself and the altar of God were measured, but not the court outside the temple because it was given over to the nations to trample for 42 months. That is the length of time of the reign of the beast. So these two witnesses will keep the beast out of the temple itself and away from the altar for 1,260 days. Now verse four. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut up the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague, as often as they desire. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. See, they will prophesy until Abaddon is released and kills them, removing the protection that comes with their authority. They will then be able to set up the abomination of desolation, which is the final sign Jesus gave that it's really the end of the world. Now on to verse 9. For three and a half days, some from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Behold, the third woe is soon to come. Before we dissect these verses, let me first say who I do not believe that it is. I realize that there are those who believe that one of the witnesses is the prophet Moses because they explain that the witnesses have the same power that Moses had, the same power that Moses performed, that is turning water into blood and striking the earth with every kind of plague. See, first glance, that's really easy to see. But I want us to read the account for ourselves. Let us not just take things at face value or what somebody else says. Let us read it for ourselves. Exodus chapter 7, verse 18 through 19. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, their canals, their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood, and there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and vessels of stone. 
So in actuality, it was Aaron who stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the waters became blood. But not only Aaron, but look, let us read verse 22. But the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. That tells us that turning water into blood was not unique to Moses and Aaron. They didn't have the patent on turning water into blood. But the magicians of Egypt could do the same exact thing by their secret arts. Now, let us take a closer look at these two witnesses and who they are. Verse 4, Revelation chapter 11, verse 4 says, These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. John was told that the two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of all the earth. So who are these two olive trees? Turn with me please to Zechariah chapter 4. And I want to read verse 3 and then we're going to skip down and read verses 11 through 14. All right, so Zechariah chapter 4, starting at verse 3. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. Now skip down to verse 11. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes for which the golden oil is poured out? And he said to me, do you not know what these are? I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. See, Zechariah said that there are two anointed ones who stand before the Lord of all the earth. And John was told the same thing as well in verses 4. There is something else I want you to notice. During the time that Zechariah saw his vision, Zerubbabel was measuring the temple, as was John, because Zerubbabel was rebuilding it. Look at Zechariah chapter 4, verse 10. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, the plumb line was in Zerubbabel's hand as the measuring rod was in John's hand. The Gentiles had just finished trampling down the temple, so to speak, and Zerubbabel was now building it. While John was told not to measure the outer courts of the temple because the Gentiles still had 42 more months in which to trample the temple. Now verses 5 and 6 of Revelation chapter 11 tells us that the two witnesses have the power to protect themselves by letting fire come out of their mouth and kill those who try to kill them. They also have the power to shut up the sky so that there be no rain as long as they're prophesying. They also have the power to turn water into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. As we saw in Zechariah's prophecy, the two witnesses were not an afterthought. They are standing before the Lord of all the earth, waiting for their time to be revealed. Now, let us add something else to the mix. I want us to read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says, It is appointed for man to die once. After that comes judgment. It is appointed or decreed for man. In other words, a date is set. It has been officially decided upon that all men will die and after that, face the judgment of God. It is a decree. It will happen. It will come to pass. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. This is something that God has determined will happen. And you know what? It will happen. But notice this. The only two men that are recorded in scripture to ever live and not die, including the God-man, Christ Jesus, who died on the cross for the sins of the world. He died for you, he died for me, he died for our families. Jesus died, but not Enoch and Elijah. Both of these men did not see death because they were taken up into heaven. That is the reason why these two men did not die. 
but were taken up into heaven. It was not because these men were more holy than anyone else. Rather, they were being prepared for a job that they have to do real, real soon. Now, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5 says that it was by faith that Enoch was taken up into heaven. And James chapter 5 verse 17 through 18 tells us that Elijah was a man just like us with the same kind of passions. See, the same things that hurt us hurt him. The same things that, that, that offended us offended him. The same things that would cause us to trip up would cause him to trip up. He was not some super Christian or, or super believer or superhuman. No, he was a man just like us with the same kinds of passion. So these men were not so different from those of us who love the Lord. They just have a different job to do. And what is that job? To be the two witnesses. Their time to prophesy is close at hand. Just look around and see all that's going on. We are close to the return of Christ. But before Christ can return, we have to go through the tribulation. The tribulation, see, don't get it mixed up. Don't get confused between the tribulation of the church and the wrath of God. You see, the tribulation is for the church. The wrath of God is for the wicked. And there are two different things. First comes the tribulation of the church, which we will have to go through. Then after that comes the wrath of God, which we will not experience. We, the church never experienced the wrath of God. But tribulation is not the wrath of God. So don't get the two confused. Now, we believe that the two unidentified witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, we're just going to put it out there, is Enoch and Elijah. That's who we believe the two witnesses are because they are the only two men who have ever lived and never tasted death. Now, some may say that they never tasted death. Yes, that is true. But neither will those who go up in the rapture. So this argument has flaws. And I say, okay, well, that's good. That's a good point. I like, I like how you think. You must always challenge people's point of view if you can see a flaw there. So let us turn our attention to Brother Paul and let us iron out this flaw for the naysayers. Let us turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35 through 38. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other green. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavens heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly of us is of another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-given spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as it is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood 
blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So according to Paul, this is a foolish thing to ask how a body will change from perishable to imperishable. It will die. It will have to die in order to be transformed. Therefore, those who are still alive on the earth at the second coming of Christ Jesus will be caught up to meet him and their earthly bodies will die in order to be given their new heavenly bodies. The image of the man of dust will perish in order to take on the image of the man of heaven. See, the rapture of the living cannot also include Enoch if he isn't one of the two witnesses, as he can't be caught up to Jesus if he's already in heaven, whole body and all. Therefore, both he and Elijah shall have to come back to the earth to die as the two witnesses do and be a sort of or type of first fruits rapture to the Lord as they were taken up to heaven a second time after they are resurrected and given that new body just as Jesus was the first fruits of the dead 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 20 the church is a type of first fruits to the Lord James chapter 1 verse 16 through 18 the 144,000 are a type of first fruits of mankind Revelation chapter 14 verse 1 through 4 and we who are in the church even experience a type of first fruits of the spirit as we yearn for the second coming of Christ Romans chapter 8 verse 23 they're even taken up into heaven on a cloud Enoch and Elijah the two witnesses they're taken up into heaven on a cloud just as the church is taken up to Jesus on a cloud at the second coming. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13 through 18. So let me sum everything up for you. In the last days, there will be two witnesses who prophesy for three and a half years. If anyone tries to kill them, they will pour out fire from their mouth and consume or kill those who try to harm them. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain as long as they're prophesying. They also will have the power to smite the earth with plagues and turn water into blood. We have identified these two witnesses as Enoch and Elijah, who are the only two men who have ever lived and never died. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, would you please hit that like button and subscribe for more videos like this. And would you also hit that share button? It would help us spread the good news of the gospel. I would really appreciate that. You see, Jesus is coming back real, real soon. Just look around at all that is going on in the earth, all that is happening. Things are speeding towards this time that the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. And we have to be prepared. We have to warn those who are just lackadaising around, who have, have a, a form of godliness. We have to warn these people so that they can be prepared for that time will be like no other time ever before or will ever be again. And we need to spread the good news of Jesus and his love for mankind, his salvation. He is a life-given spirit who wants to give us life and life more abundantly. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for watching. I'm Kenny Yates, and this has been The End Times. Be blessed and stay blessed.